Every day, thousands of people in this prosperous province of ours face poverty and homelessness. And while that may be hidden from sight for many, it has been in plain view of our next guest for decades. Kathy Crow is a street nurse. She has spent decades fighting for those on the margins. Her new book is called A Knapsack Full of Dreams, Memoirs of a Street Nurse. It is vital reading, and it brings Kathy Crow to our studio tonight. So good to see you again. You too. How Thank you been you. these days? Good. Very good. I want to start with a very simple question. But what's a street nurse? Okay. Um, well, street nurse is a nurse that really specializes in providing health care to people that are homeless. And the term was actually coined by a homeless guy over 30 years ago. He yelled out to us one day, hey, street nurse. And it was a compliment. So we've used the name ever since. And you're okay to be called that? Very much so. Okay. Yeah. I want to, your, your book, first of all, is fascinating reading and it's harrowing reading from time mm -hmm. to time. And I do want to read one excerpt here about uh, some of your dealings with the, with, with the experience of homelessness in this province. So Sheldon, let's bring this graphic up and here we go. My nurse hands once did more useful things. They immunized the fat, healthy thighs of infants. They carefully measured cardiac drugs to administer to young heart patients. They bathed both the elderly lady after her surgery and the 24-year-old Italian-Canadian woman after her death. Now they carry a black bag into the streets, alleyways, and ravines. The bandages I carry no longer cover the wounds of my patients. My vitamins will not prevent the white plague of tuberculosis from taking another victim. I cannot even help someone achieve one peaceful night of safety and sleep. Only roofs will do that, and I am not a carpenter. Kathy, there is a level of frustration that emerges from that quote that no doubt you have earned thanks to decades of mm -hmm. trying to make progress on this mm -hmm. issue. Do you feel you have? Um, not right now, actually, no. I mean, we've had many successes and victories, you know, a new federal homelessness program, lots of shelter openings, but everything is worse since when I began 30 everything years ago. Everything is worse since yeah, you began? pretty much. I mean, there's a few innovative new programs around tuberculosis and things like that, but um, there are triple the number of homeless people than when I started. Um, it's a crisis across the country. There are now encampments. It's now normal to see tents on Toronto main streets in Peterborough, Kingston. Um, so it's a dark time. How do you personally deal with, because, you know, I've known you for a long time. Mm -hmm. I remember when you ran for office a couple of times. You, you seem a fairly upbeat person considering all of what you have to deal with. How do you yeah. do that? I mostly, I mostly am. I'm mostly optimistic. Um, I rely on really close colleagues uh, who became best friends, um, who helped me kind of strategize to figure out, okay, everything is horrible right now. What, what can we still do? What's our next creative strategy? Um, and then, you know, there's personal things. I've got grand, grandchildren and, you know, as you know, I love baseball and things like that. But it is a, it is a, overwhelming time right now, this winter in particular. Can you take yeah. us back? Your first nursing job, what was it? Oh, sure. I was in cardiology at Toronto General Hospital, now called University Health Network, and I loved it. What would you like about it? Uh, it was exciting. It was cutting edge. There was a lot of experimentation. Um, there was a lot of cutting, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, we were seeing... Um, New, new trends and issues in cardiac disease um, that were now being treated thanks to, you know, penicillin, for example. Mm. And so it was very exciting. How and when did you make the transition to becoming a street nurse? Uh, I ended up going from the hospital to Bay Street, um, which was strange. That was because of the cardiac connection with cardiac stress testing of executives. And then I went to... Um, and then uh, the doctors there were extra billing at the time, and they wanted me to also extra bill, like should, above, above OHIP. Right. So that was before extra billing was allowed. So physicians could charge above and beyond OHIP a lot of money for some types of health care. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to do that, and I felt this wasn't the norm. This wasn't what I expected health care to be about. So I, I saw an ad in the newspaper for South Riverdale Community Health Center I applied, I walked around the neighborhood, got the job, I think because I walked around the neighborhood. Um, and I, I've 
been in that sector for a long, long time. And then I moved to Street Health, a little organization that had just gotten funding from Minister Eleanor Kaplan, who was Minister of Health, and um, I was the second nurse hired. But I went there more because of the nursing model as opposed to thinking I wanted to look after homeless people. I had kind of all the stereotypes that people might still have. Did you have what you might describe as a kind of a, a, a bit of a naive background as it related to all of the misery you would soon come to see? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I grew up in Coburg and Kingston. Um, uh, in my whole life, I had never really considered um, the issues around homelessness. I was constantly shocked. I tell one story about wondering why so many people had maritime accents at Sherburne and Dundas, having no clue that it was because of poverty in the maritimes. and. You know, seeing a man that, I forget the exact name, but he, he might have had a shirt wearing that had the name Jim on it, but his name was really Bill or something, mm -hmm. and not realizing, well, he got that shirt in a clothing donation room. And I, I was I, very, very naive. You've had a heck of an education since I then. I have. Every, and that's why I stuck with it, actually, over 30 years. Um, every day, something new to learn, a new challenge, something new to mm -hmm. learn. You discuss in your book the fallout of homelessness care when something called the National Housing Program of Canada <clears throat> was cancelled in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, what were Canadians mm -hmm. losing when this was happening? We were losing a national program similar to Medicare. You know, a fully funded program uh, that had participation by the provinces where we were, as a country, building 20,000 new units a year across the country housing for seniors, housing for students, co-op housing, housing for families and children, supportive housing. And I was a street nurse at the time at Sherburne and Dundas, downtown Toronto, when the program was cut. And I, I wasn't even aware. There was no protest. There, were, there was no activism around it. Why was it cut? Um, well, <laughs> I mean, it was cut by two, it, in two stages by two federal governments. Um, and presumably, I mean, it's thought that it was cut part, part of a period of, you know, a retraction from funding social programs, corporate tax cuts instead, um, other decisions that were being made. And I, I hope that I think the private sector would pick up the slack, which was not the case. Hmm. Uh, I do remember Jim Flaherty, may mm -hmm. he rest in peace, the federal finance minister mm -hmm. at the time, saying, actually, if you look at the Constitution, there's no obligation by the federal government to fund social housing. That is a provincial mm -hmm. responsibility. And thus, I think from a strictly technical constitutional point of view, mm -hmm. he felt the federal government ought not to be in that business. I mean, he's not wrong in that respect, is he? Um, I think I've heard that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the a piece of good news now is that we now have a National Housing Act and housing is back on the agenda. It's not a fully funded program, but it's back. Um, you know, and constitutional lawyers have argued about this. Um, it's, it's hard to not imagine it being a responsibility, given everyone understands the importance of it um, to their lives. Do we have anything close to a national housing strategy today? Well, many people think so, but I don't. <laughs> um, and I point to the evidence in the sky in Toronto. We've had a national housing strategy for a couple of years now. It is helping a few communities across the country, but there's not one crane in the sky in downtown Toronto that's building um, social housing. It's Are you not, sure about that? Look, I look I around am. the city and I see 150 cranes. I see more it's, cranes in the sky in this city than anywhere else in North true. America. No, I'm 100% sure about it. There's but one no social housing. No, there's one transitional project called AGAL um, mm -hmm. for LGBT youth that's under construction. The crane is just not up right now. <laughs> it's pretty much done. Um, no, that's, that's a fact. <laughs> Both Ottawa and Toronto councillors, city councillors, are looking at declarations of emergency by their city councillors because they're now realizing our cities are not doing well with this national housing strategy. What would a declaration of emergency actually do? Well, I think it can leverage resources at the city level and it can be a huge cry for help by a municipality. I want to put a picture up now. Well, actually, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon okay. Osmond, to do it because I don't have any buttons out here. But you recognize that fellow there in that picture, don't you? Oh, sure. Okay, tell us the circumstances. That's, of course, Jack Layton, the former NDP yeah. leader, uh, former Toronto City Councillor. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's going on there? Um, so this is a party, a celebration day, um, after the uh, tent city residents 
on the Toronto waterfront, about 140 of them had been evicted. And this was a celebration held, um, I believe, at Wood Green Community Centre, where we're celebrating the fact that they're now all in housing. They won housing. And um, Jack was pivotal to the work we did at, at Tent City. What were the conditions at Tent City like? Oh, boy. <laughs> Um, well, I describe them as being like inner city refugee camp conditions. Initially, it was tents and trailers and tarps, and, and it was brutal. Um, and I, I was involved for three years with Toronto Disaster Relief Committee. We brought in, uh, we brought in wood stoves, uh, people built houses. We brought in prefab houses. Um, John Van Nostrand, an architect, actually built a, a model with some of the guys. Um, portable toilets, that was the file I was responsible for, which was very hard. Um, so it grew to the point that there were no tents after a point. There were about 53 shacks or houses, generators. Um, at one point, um, with Jack's help and some union workers uh, plugged into electricity and water at one point, but then that got cut off. Um, it was very rough, <laughs> very cold in the winters. Um, but as, there was a strong spirit, especially of activism, by some of the residents. And what actually, like what was the confluence of events that came together that eventually found a solution to this problem? Um, it, it was quite outstanding. Um, that We were always worried about harassment and potential eviction. This was on Home Depot land. Um, so what happened was out of the blue, the eviction happened. Uh, I personally got a 30-minute warning by Adam Vaughn, who was then a journalist. Um, and we Now a member of parliament. Now a member of parliament. My member <laughs> of parliament, actually. And, and uh, so people poured down there to provide support. And there was a press conference. And we went to City Hall. And um, one thing led to another. And uh, an emergency shelter had to be open that night for people. And it led to a very significant program um, it was called a, a pilot rent supplement program that became a precursor for programs that the City of Toronto and other cities now rely on, which is topping up somebody's income so they can afford rent. So eventually, uh, workers worked with the folks. They all got into housing um, and mostly stayed in the housing. Some people had to move because of, you know, crisis in the housing, bed bugs mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, Dry, for example, who is amazing, is still in the very first apartment he moved into. So that was a win for you? People, yeah, that was a huge win. People gained weight. Some people went back to school. People got connected to family. And nobody said, hey, I want to live on the street. Take me back there. Mm. Nobody said that. You know, there's a, uh, well, you talk about it in the book, so I know you know about it. It's something called Housing First. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it, it's had a lot of plaudits over the years as having done good work to get people who live in the streets, off the streets. Mm -hmm. What's your view of Housing First? So, um, I mean, just to preface my comments, we've always believed in housing first for people as opposed to shelter, but there just hasn't been housing for people to go to. So essentially, it's an American model imported into Canada. It's now federal, provincial, city policy. But my problem with it is that it prioritizes people with addiction and mental health issues. So it's not really housing for all. Um, so it, and it's also about removing the, the visible homeless from the street. So essentially, you have to be on the street to access the program, with you know a few exceptions. It looks a little different across the country. But the bottom line is there hasn't been housing for people to go into. So it's kind of looked like we have a national housing program, but we really don't. It's kind of like this piecemeal program that has helped some people. But it's not housing for families with children. It's not housing for seniors. It's not housing for people that might have cancer and be in a shelter. It's very targeted. And honestly, um, Lilani Farha, the UN Rapporteur on Housing, recently made a comment that one of the worst things she's seen is the American cities in California. Um, and I point to that to say, I think we're heading in that direction, which is poor, which is parking lots being allocated for families with children in cars. Mm. And that's housing first in the United States. And how is it looking here? Well, with the rare exception, it's worse across the country. Homelessness is worse. Do you have um, more hope 
given the announcement made last month by the Mayor of Toronto, John Tory, to, you know, pretty significantly increase the property taxes of the people who live in the capital city of this province in order to build more housing? Very pleased with the property tax increase, or levy as it's called. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and um, I, I think we have a few concerns about it. Affordability is not defined. A few other um, key instruments are not in the plan, but are going to come. My worry is that it, it takes three to five years, right, to get a project up and going. Mm -hmm. What do we do in the meantime? So uh, we're definitely headed in the right direction. Um, and I think people will be supporting that. But I have a big but, like what, what happens in the meantime? It also makes a very strong statement, which is housing, a housing first statement in the report, that once they, they reach their 1,000 shelter target, they won't put any more money into shelters. Hmm. And we, we still, for many, many years, are going to need a mass infusion of money into shelters. Right now, we're relying on like soccer dome type you know, sprung structures, they're called, where we're sheltering people that are, it's real, they really look like post-Hurricane Katrina emergency sites. You ran for office twice. I did. You ran for the, for the NDP, I'm trying to remember which elections now, I can't remember um, the years. 10, 2010 and 11. Okay. I think, yeah. And was it once federally and once provincially? Both provincially. Both provincially, yeah. okay. Um, <laughs> well, 2011 was an election year provincially. So. Mm -hmm. 2010 was a by-election. Oh, it was the by-election. George Smitherman had resigned. There we yeah. go. Okay, okay. What did you learn in that case when you were running for office about the possibilities of politics to solve the problems that you live every day as a street mm. nurse? I think there, there are huge possibilities. Um, um, I enjoyed very much the door knocking and seeing the conditions and really have encouraged many others to, to do that aspect of volunteering in the future. Um, I think it's huge, uh, but I think you need brave leadership and, and, and we've seen that in the past on some issues, right? Um, and I just felt I was unemployed at the time. That's I ran and <laughs> Jack Layton talked me into it actually. Um, that's amazing, actually, we, uh, should, we should point out that's amazing. I mean, given, given the work that you did in nursing, on the streets, you know, under the most dire of circumstances, and then you suddenly somehow found yourself unemployed. Mm -hmm. And, like, why? How, how can that be possible, given all of your experience? <laughs> well, I thought it was just a blip, but it lasted four years, actually. And most people don't know. I've only, you know, through writing this, kind of made it public, um, because I kept doing all the work. Um, I was constantly still doing the same work. Um, you know, two of my best friends, approached me separately and said, you're blacklisted. Um, and, and I was told that by some of the places where I interviewed, places that I had worked before well, even. You, you are a well-known S At, disturber, if I can put it yeah, that way. Yeah, and, and, and executive directors really said, you know, we, our funding could be threatened if we have you here. And, and it's, um, it's one of the reasons I still do the speaking out. Um, because many of the, there's a whole group of younger street nurses out there now, um, s some of whom I mentor, which I'm really happy about. They're not allowed to speak out. I, I mean, I look um, at you, you're wearing the Order of Canada. I am. You've I'm got the Order of Canada yeah. and you're blacklisted from getting nursing jobs in mm -hmm. healthcare centers or hospitals. That seems crazy. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, I, so I, I had to write about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and because as young, younger students were constantly coming to me and asking me about my work and what I was doing, and so I still felt valued. So that was very helpful, and, and I tell the story. You do, and, and you've yeah. been at Ryerson for the last many years, right? Yes. What are you doing yeah. at Ryerson? I'm a, uh, they have a DVP program, Distinguished Visiting Professor. I'm a Distinguished Visiting Practitioner, um, and it's very much thanks to Meyer C. Matiki, who is a friend of Jack Layton's, oh, yeah. and... Sheldon Levy, who brought me in, and he was um, the president. Yes, past president, and so uh, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I want to work with students from all backgrounds on housing and homeless issues. So that's what I do. I mostly take them out of classes for different professors, journalism, business, criminology, and I take them out to see real life experiences. I take them to city hall, I meet the mayor, city councilors, watch committees. 
uh, homeless memorial, other events. We we do walks through the new the newly redeveloped Regent Park. Mm. So it depends on what's going on in the city, what we do. And then I help to coordinate the Jack Layton School for Youth Leadership, which happens uh, usually about twice a year during Reading Week. Um, and anyone can use me across the university. So mm. master's students, um, professors. So I get to still be involved and engaged and doing advocacy from my alma mater, Ryerson. That's great. I got to ask you one last kind of weird question, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, like I read the book and every chapter starts with a movie review. Now yes. this, is, this is a book about you know, death <laughs> and destruction and every chapter starts with a movie review. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Yeah, well, so um, movies have inspired me. It was the movie, If You Love This Planet. Um, Helen Caldicott. About Helen Caldicott and the threat of nuclear war that made me an activist on other issues. Um, so throughout, uh, throughout my life, I think I've, personally, I've turned to movies for inspiration. And, y you know, you'll know that there are a couple um, post-apocalyptic type films that mm -hmm. introduce the darkest period of my work around homelessness. Um, yeah, so that's, I grew up with movies. Uh, I've made movies. Yes, um, you have. Yeah, so. And Shelley Saywell made a documentary yeah, about you. Yeah, she did. So they've been a, a theme throughout my life. Terrific. Well, we're happy to uh, put before the public's attention a knapsack full of dreams, memoirs of a street nurse, which has brought Kathy Crow to our studio tonight. And we're very grateful for your time. Thank you. It's been Thank a pleasure. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.